It's time for the weekly Q&A, and of course, we're going to be doing these questions from our Premium Property Inner Circle community. So um, some of our mentees that are asking these questions, and I hope they really help you to move forward in your property journey. <laughs> Now, let's jump straight into the questions. The first one is from Tim. Tim is asking all about purchasing property. Um, he's wanting to use his own funds um, to buy a property. And then what he's asking is, what if he wants to put in a limited company? And uh, can his limited company actually buy that property from him? Well, great question, by the way. So here's the thing. So you, can have, you could be buying in personal names. You can also be buying in limited companies. And the thing is, when you are selling it to your other company, just be keeping, keeping in mind that there will be a capital gains. Now, you need to get tax advice on this, but there will be a capital gains, and also you're going to end up paying stamp duty land tax, and there'll be another set of solicitor's costs for actually that transaction. Because although it might be you, or, and it's your limited company, they'll be treated as separate entities. So I would question, why are you actually doing that? What's the reason for doing that? So you might decide, to buy that property in the limited company in the first place. So you would avoid all those costs I mentioned and get extra value. Or you might uh, decide to keep it in your personal name, depending on your tax scenario. So think about this. Why are you doing, why are you taking it from personal name to limited company? Why don't you just buy in the limited company? Why don't you just keep it in the personal name? So they be the tax questions to ask and uh, uh, we can discuss that further. Great question, the team. Moving forward. Uh, I've got another question here from Zaid. Zaid is asking um, uh, a technical question about um, uh, working with listing buildings. Now, the thing about listed buildings is, I would say, Zaid, these buildings tend to be beautiful. Now, we've got a number of these in our portfolio, and they are gorgeous properties. Georgian windows, beautiful looking fronts, um, quite lovely. And some of them have got some beautiful interiors as well. The only thing about listed buildings is, I wouldn't say don't get into a listed building project. All I would say is just be aware as a quick rule of thumbs, double your costs when it comes to your refurbishment and double the time length for your project as well. And if you've got any form of planning gain that you're doing with those types of buildings, just be aware there's usually a separate department that deals with listed buildings and it's a whole separate niche of the planning department. And uh, your, your cost will also rise in that. So just factor these figures in into your returns and you'll be absolutely fine. So just be aware of that, listed buildings, although they're beautiful projects and look amazing once they're done. We have a question here from Hesos. Hesos says, hi Sifu. I don't know why he calls me Sifu. He's even translated it into teacher. I'm not teaching. I'm just sharing with you what I've been doing for the last eight years and carrying on doing right now. Okay, get on with it, Cam. Sure. Well, he's asking about properties purchased at auction. Um, are they subject to stamp duty, land tax, SDLT? And yes, they are. Now, there's a number of different ways of the stamp duty land tax um, that you will pay. So, for example, if you're uh, buying commercial property right now, commercial properties, there is zero stamp duty for properties under the price of £150,000. And it gets even better. If you're buying a commercial property that's a semi-commercial, so you've got a commercial there and you've got a residential element as well, what you'll find is still the stamp duty is zero up to £150,000 and you pay a further 2% thereafter, really low amount. Now, when you're buying your residential, if you have, if it's actually your uh, first residential, then your stamp duty is gonna be much lower. Typically, you're looking at 3%. If you're looking to be, if you're an investor, and you've got more than one property, then you're typically adding another 2% to that figure to start with. Just something to be aware of. Now, let's say you've got your residential, and you're buying another residential, and you're in the interims where you've got two properties, well, you pay the higher stamp duty on the second one and you can reclaim it back when you sell your first property that you were originally living in, if it's residential. Something to be mindful of. So, um, different ways that you can do this. Now, there is a little caveat. There is a little, little caveat where you can actually end up paying zero stamp duty land tax and that is when the property is uh, unhabitable. And now, you may have to have a conversation about your solicitors about this because some will accept it, some won't. So the good thing to do is to provide evidence, provide photos, and show why the property is derelict, show why the property is unhabitable. Now, if the council tax has been ceased from that, and there isn't any council tax, 
that's a great way of showing your solicitors because ultimately the solicitor who's going to be putting in that, uh, that payment for the stamp duty land tax to show them that there isn't any council tax, there's an unhabitable property and the chances are that you can waive that stamp duty land tax. Like what I say, many solicitors don't really want to um, uh, apply that um, because HMRC uh, of course lose a lot of revenue on this. However, if it is within your rights and you can see that the property is genuinely derelict, um, it's uninhabitable, then there are many cases when the stamp duty land tax can also be mitigated completely. Although, use that very wisely, please. Okay, moving forward. We've got another question. We've got loads of questions today. Now, we've got another question here from Mark. Mark is asking, during uh, one of the seminars, it was mentioned about extending leases, and it really depends upon where the lease is to find out if it's worth actually doing in terms of increasing the value of the property. Um, Mark, it may be the case, um, you know, do check in with me, let me know if this is the case. Uh, I think what we're discussing here wasn't actually the short leases. What we were discussing was title splits, where you can take a property, let's say it's one freehold, and you've got two uh, units in it already, but they were under one title, and what you've done is you used um, a legal process to create two leases or on those two flats so you've got one and two leases now in that instance usually the value of that property will go up and it does really depend on what the area is because in some instances the values won't go up something that don't people don't really talk about and um, so it really depends on the area so that's what I was discussing I believe uh, do let me know if that's the case and that's what we're discussing so title splitting rather than uh, short-term leases in my experience with short-term leases you typically end up adding value no matter where it is as long as the lease extension uh, cost uh, marries into what you're doing and you can get the property at a good value um, there's usually a margin in that so there's usually an uplift uh, just got to work the numbers out hope I'm making sense here for you so far we're going through this really fast aren't we listen back to this video as many times as you like I'd love to hear your comments and if you haven't already subscribed well you can see it on the screen here right now you can subscribe to our channel and you can click on that bell icon as well so moving forward, we've got a, ca a question here from Reshim um, and he's asking all about creating deeds of trust on rental properties um, with unequal rental sharing. Now, when you're creating deeds of trust, uh, these are not registered typically at land registry. This is a parallel document. So a deed of trust tends to be a parallel document that works in conjunction with what else you've got going on. So for example, let's say you've got a mortgage lender you, on, on the property, on the title. Let's say they've got a first charge they're uh, holding on to that property. Um, you can still have your, your, your personal agreement, your business agreement uh, working in, in, in conjunction. So typically, it's not registered land registry, in my experience, and uh, it's a separate, like I say, it's a separate agreement. So uh, something to keep in mind. And yes, you can um, decide how you want to share that income or how you want to share that capital growth if that's what's in the deed of trust according to your agreement, according to your personal scenario with whoever it is that you're working with. Yeah? So you could decide to proportion the rents, you could decide to proportion the capital uplift. It's really uh, a process that you guys sit down together and thrash out and understand what you actually want to do and uh, then you can make that decision. And uh, deed of trust, like I say, is a parallel to what else is going on land registry. So, quick fire round of questions there, quick fire round of answers. Uh, stay with us, it's Cameron Devady at Premier Property, helping you take your property investing to the next level. I'll see you on the next video. Bye for now. <laughs>